So let me introduce myself first of all. Um, my name's Jennifer, Jen for short, and um, I'm currently the Data and Taxonomy Manager for BBC Scotland. So I'll give you a bit of a background about me, which might help you in, when you come to ask me questions later. I am not naturally a technical person. I am a librarian. That is my role. That's what I have been at the BBC for the last 15 years. Um, I started working with film and have moved through various permutations of sport librarian, news librarian, to become the data and taxonomy manager. Now, my job does not involve stuffing animals, which is what most people immediately ask me when I tell them what I am. But what it does involve is a lot of work in developing and maintaining our digital library. And having to look at the way that we make our archive accessible to our users and how people actually access that content. So this is more of what I do. I, if you're looking for some advice on how to stuff your favourite pet, then I'm afraid you need to go elsewhere. Um, but if you'd like to hear how we at BBC Scotland are currently trying to make the most of our archive and help our users find what they need, then I guess stick around. So before I get started, I'd like to show you just a little short promo of what we at BBC Scotland do, because we are slightly different from the main BBC. Make a cut with your hands to take a drink In the same way that your father did Throw a stone upon the river's lid Watch the circles take you home What an amazing space! Cause sometimes it's who, not what you do Just cause your father did Doesn't mean that you should do I don't want to lose you I love you Don't go away from you Scotland! What a year! BBC Scotland, making every moment count. Now, that short promo was in our digital library, and I just, within two minutes, whacked it out, stuck it on here. Simple. It was really, really easy to get it out there. If you might have seen from that that we basically cover sport, news, drama, um, documentaries, factual, music and arts, children's, education and entertainment. We also create content for our Gaelic channels, so that's Radio Nangale and BBC Alba and Radio Scotland. We deliver content to the network channels and we, on average we produce about 1300 hours of new TV programmes every year and 10,000 hours of radio programmes. So I think you'll agree that's an awful lot of content for us as a library to deal with um, and to make it accessible to our users, which is the main point of our library. A little bit of history. When we moved to Pacific Key in 2007, we also made the move to becoming a fully integrated end-to-end -end digital production. And at the heart of that, was to set the digital library. Now, our remit at the time was we had to be creative, digital, simple, and open. And the system is indeed creative, open, and digital, and relatively simple to use, but the creation of an integrated digital workflow with a fully functional digital library on over 700 desktops is anything but simple. That's our plumbing diagram. That's basically what we based our entire system on. Um, really not simple at all to even try and make head nor tail of it, never mind when it's in that tiny little telly over there. Um, but it was with this mantra that was in our heads that we set to work. And we gathered at the time what was called a substantial set of requirements. I think it was the polite way of saying we were quite fussy and we basically had a massive list of what we wanted our digital library to do. So our basic aims 
were to facilitate end-to-end -end digital program making uh, with digital play out, server-based storage. We also wanted to allow our users controlled but instant access to all the content and the content metadata whilst providing broadcast quality audio and video on their desktop. That was the really important part of it, to let people actually see what they're looking for. Whereas previously, you're just looking at a whole bunch of words. You can't necessarily picture what it is that you've got. Um, we also needed secure online storage for archive holdings, but I'm not really going to deal with that. <laughs> um, and then from a purely librarian perspective, we needed something that would save on our search time. So by helping people to help themselves, that saved on our time doing searches. But we also needed something that would save on our cataloging effort, because our old system, it took hours and hours to catalog one program. So we needed to cut that down and make it simpler. Um, and we kind of believed that once we'd combined all these aims together, we would have something that would make the best use of what we had. This is basically what we ended up creating. <laughs> we, we found much of what we, we required were standard features in our dome. And then with some development work with Ardendo, as they were then called, now Vizrt, um, we basically could have this digital library to call our own. Now, I know it looks a little bit grey, and I know you can't really see much of it, but it's not all about looks. It's about what it actually does. And um, it has really made a massive difference to how we use our archive. But the, the key to integrating this digital library into the workflow was a development of our interfaces to the content production system. So VCS for radio and AVID for TV and also our playout system, which is Omnibus. And paramount to that, to enable all these interfaces to work together, was the development of pretty rigorous metadata standards, really, um, and procedures. Because after all, a system is only as good as the data it contains. It's that old adage of rubbish in, rubbish out. That's the kind of the polite way of putting it, I think, you know. Um, and so, in order, to um, ensure interoperability between these systems, common semantics had to be employed. So we basically had to create our data model. That data model was SMEF compliant. I don't know if anyone knows about SMEF. It's the BBC Standard Media Exchange Framework. Um, and it provides a set of data definitions to help ensure that the systems do work together. It, it kind of meant that what we had to look at was how we defined our data in different systems. Uh, was a program number in AVID what we thought was a program number in the digital library? What makes a program title different from an episode title? I mean, it all sounds really simple, but you would not believe the amount of hours of discussions we had over what constituted a shot type. You know, it's... It seems simple, but really it's not. Different people do have different ideas of what these fields mean. Um, and at the same time, the, the sheer amount, the sheer volume of information that was produced by productions as well has to be then collated and updated. So you're not just talking about just getting a few bits and bobs out of you know, a couple of disparate places. There is a massive amount of information that comes from both radio and TV. And of course, that's been increased with digital production because you can add data from the very beginning as it, and then keep adding it as it goes through the flow until eventually it reaches a digital library. Previously, we were lucky sometimes even to get a title on a, on a tape or you would get sport logs that you had absolutely no idea who the teams were who scored if there was even a goal scored because the writing was so bad you just had no idea what it was. So now we've gone from that to just a real glut of information that we have to try and deal with in order to help people find what they're looking for again. And on top of that, <laughs> all this extra information, we also have more content coming in because 
previously we didn't capture all radio programmes because we just didn't have the ability to. So we kind of cherry picked what programmes came into the archive. Same with TV, we didn't get rushes, we didn't, you know, we got some news items, not all of them. It, so the increase in the volume of content as well as information, again, it's, it's made it even more work for us to try and give people that access. So without the logical data model and without the metadata standards and procedures, we would basically find ourselves drowning in a sea of information and our users would be like trying to do like a lucky dip really it would be more like a lucky dip for users because without adding the proper information at the proper point it's difficult to find what you're looking for and as there's different workflows in place for both tv and radio and even within the various departments whether it's news or sport or drama we we basically decided to implement a minimum metadata set and this would ensure that all content, wherever it came from, would have basic but consistent metadata attached. And this basically ensured that we could consistently exchange metadata throughout the systems. And also that our users could have instant access to their material. As soon as they hit that send button into Digital Library, they could find it again immediately, even if our catalogers didn't catalog it for two weeks. They, the basics would be there and they would be able to find it. So the success of, of such a project as a minimum metadata set does rely on everyone signing up to it. it. Took an awful lot of discussion, an awful lot of cajoling, deciphering of various workflows and again agreeing on what fields meant what and what a shot type was, what an episode title was, that kind of thing. And we agreed on this. This is our minimum metadata set. There's not actually that many. Um, and indeed, of these, the content type, material type, they're drop downs. So you've got a choice of like five different content types, three different material types. Program number, program title, that's all easy. The unique ID is system generated, so the user doesn't even have to bother about that. Ingest date is also system generated. And the restriction indicator, again, you're picking red, amber, green. Simple as that. So really, we're only asking the production users to add in five fields. So it's not an awful lot to ask. And I must say, it has been successful in that way. Further information can also be added by our media managers, who are our librarians. Um, and production staff also tend to add more information. And that information also transfers to the digital library. But as long as you've got the minimum metadata set, that's all we're really, that's the only thing that we are making mandatory. Anything extra is brilliant from production. And it saves us time adding it later on. Um, it's, it's a bit hard to tell from these slides. Again, really small. Um, but things like series title, item title, TX date, all come from Avid into Digital Library. Um, in VCS, these are their, one of their take data cards. We, again, take extra information from there, like inwards, outwards, producer, contributor. And all that information transfers to Digital Library and then we build on that to make it accessible. The data integrity is ensured by the, this minimum metadata set, but it is also supported by the media managers and the checks that they do on that data before it comes to the digital library. Naming conventions, managed data like drop down lists, all help to provide consistent and unique and meaningful data. But it's not overstating the point to say that data management has to be properly resourced, properly supported and properly managed in order to be effective. Automated, you know, automated data controls can only go so far. It's the media managers, in our case, who are the true gatekeepers. If it's not right, it's not getting in. I mean, after all, we've got those mandatory fields. But if you wanted to, and I don't know why you would want to, you could basically just type in any old gobbledygook in the kind of free text field, so like program title. We've got 
controlled fields like our, our program number is a controlled field so you couldn't put in any old gobbledygook there but free text fields like program title people could just put in xxxxx and it's our media managers who make sure that that doesn't happen so you know they are they are the true bouncers basically of our system um, capturing content capturing new content is really only part of the job the whole point of the system is to allow users access from any desktop in BBC Scotland, it is possible to search for finished programmes, for clips, for items, rushes. And once they've found what they're looking for, they can view, they can listen, they can create an EDL, they can clip up, and then they can decide to send that to the content production systems where it then goes into the edit. It's a pretty quick way of doing it actually in comparison to the old way where you had to come down to the library, have a chat with the librarian, get what you needed, then wander along to the vault, pick, you know, it, it took a wee while. Now it's bang, it's there on your desktop and ready for you when you want. Um, and without these capabilities, really everything in that, in that library would be beautifully catalogued and archive but it would be as much use as a as a as a chocolate teapot as they would say um, and much of what i've spoken about so far is to do with our new archive i'll call it new archive what about our old archive you know the the classic alan wells winning gold in 1980 or sean connery cycling around the disused shipyard in the 70s that kind of that the kind of stuff that most people are expecting from an archive, you know, the classic shots of Glasgow in the 60s. Um, we, when we built the digital library, we didn't actually have the resource to just dump everything in it. So we started at year zero and had nothing in the digital library, and we've built it as we've gone along, and it's actually worked out really nicely for us because we're able to cherry pick what goes into that archive, we're able to look at what our users are asking for. We look at user inquiries, we have a knowledge of events that are coming up, you know, things like Burns Night comes up every year, everyone always wants the same stuff. We, Olympic Games, the Commonwealth Games, we are able to, our experts are basically able to go in, look at the archive, look at the archive that isn't currently in the digital archive and build collections and build collections that hopefully help our users to make the most of what we have. We, we can add material that people have, don't even have a clue was even in our archive, you know, and it basically helps us to highlight any archive gems. We can say, look at this, you know, use this, this, this would be really lovely, this black and white shot of, you know, kids playing in the street at sunset, you know, in the gorbals, and it's those kind of shots that people want. And being able to see it, and being able to load it in there for people, it, it makes a massive difference. You know, just people looking at catalogue and seeing kids playing in the street, you can't get the feeling for that archive so much as when you're, you're viewing it. Um, and I think being able to do this and building our archive this way has been really good for us and sometimes we're loading things on that pe before people even realize that they need it you know um, so we do have a really nice way of bringing archive to our users really and and trying to almost push it in a way to people saying oh you know burns nights come up have you looked at this you know have you looked at this material this hasn't been used for a while this was on a digi that had been you know, sitting in the vault for 25 years and hadn't been looked at, here it is. Um, and it's, you know, it's been great for us that way. So if you remember our mantra previously of being creative, digital, simple and open, what this digital archive does is it, it, it completely opens up our, our archive to people. And from a user perspective, it is simple to use. It is simple to do. And just a few clicks, their chosen archive can be part of their edit, you know, and um, this has helped a lot of our productions to save time, perhaps money, um, 
and it's also helping to share the content across genres and across platforms. There's not so much of that. Well, that's mine anymore. You know, it's you know, if you if um, drama shot something and, and it was kind of squirrelled away underneath desks previously, whereas now we take the rushes, they're in the archive, and there are controls over who can use it, but it's viewable and people can see what is available more so. So there's more choice. There's more. There's just more archive there to choose from, and it does support the concept of kind of 360 degree commissioning, which is what, what we're all after, you know. Um, for instance, I mean, the, the um, again, it's quite small, <laughs> but the, um, the rushes from the history of Scotland, which there are masses of them, and really good rushes, really high quality, they've been reused in many other BBC programmes, such as like A Portrait of Scotland, or News have used them, dra you know, dramas use them. They've been they've been great for us in that way, and if anything, the ability to provide access to that content that might be used rushes in particular. That's what provides the greatest value to our users because the rushes previously might have been hidden under desks. They might have been used to prop up chairs. A producer might have taken them home with them. These are all things that have happened. Um, now. They come in the, you know, to the digital library and they're available for everyone and they provide a really rich seam for us to tap. Um, and it's led to kind of less reshooting, saving a bit of money. Coast rushes have been reused all over the place because, again, they're magnificent shots. So why not reuse them, you know? Um, and it does save time chasing your content again. You know, it's, it's there. Everyone can access it. You could have 15 different people accessing that same piece of content, whereas previously you'd be chasing each other down corridors, trying to grab the tape off of each other. You know, it's we don't have to do that anymore. Again, in order to help um, transfer content around the systems, we have a minimum metadata set again. If the content is transferred as a whole, like if you want to transfer the whole program, you just click on basically where it is that you want to send it to. It's and it, off it goes, and that's it. Bang, it's there, and the user is basically none the wiser at w all the mapping that's gone on in the background. Um, in the case of sending clips, again, the user's forced to add a requisite amount of metadata. The yellow fields here, which you can see, there's not much. Um, they are mandatory and you know of course again you can type you can lead a user to a form but you can't force them to fill it in properly unless you've got a media manager standing over everyone so again this is where user education and cooperation comes into play and this is where the media managers again come they they can help out a lot by helping with that education helping with explaining to people why they really need to add the proper information to be able to find their material again. Um, because quite often they are getting calls from people to say, oh, I can't find my piece that, you know, and it's just because they've mislabeled it or they've sent it to the wrong place. And again, it's our media managers that can get into the system and find it again for them. Um, another of our aims was to facilitate digital play out just quickly. At the moment we've achieved this with promos, which was one of the ones that I showed you earlier, and we're working on the next step, we're working on BBC One Scotland programmes. Um, again, the process only works if the metadata is right and if, we, if the metadata has been agreed on between the areas and nothing can be transferred to play out without the requisite metadata in place, which includes a technical and editorial review check. If that hasn't been done, it won't go. No matter how many times you hit it, it will not go. Um, it's also, I should also say, it's also possible to block content with the system, which again does help with, when we said we wanted to give users controlled access, it means that if a production has said, we don't want those rushes used by anyone else, you can put a block on them and they won't be used. So you know, you're, you feel, it, it helps our users feel safe that we are taking care of, of their archive, of their material. Um, of course, before anything can be used, it has to be found. <laughs> um, we spent a long time 
deliberating over the digital library metadata, like the internal metadata, the search metadata. There were spreadsheets everywhere. I've lost count of the amount of spreadsheets that I've worked on. Um, and we were attempting to find a common thread between TV and radio, and there's a lot that they have in common, but there were obviously some fields that just wouldn't be in both, so we have added them. Um, so where we could, we mapped the two requirements to come up with one field, but we ended up with a massive metadata set. Um, and to eradicate any ambiguity, we added tooltips, which I know seems really simple, but it does help to explain what is expected in those fields, because again, because different people expect sometimes different things. Because um, as, we, as we know from experience, not everyone agrees on what an episode title is. Um, there is in no way enough space to show um, our entire metadata set. Um, we have metadata sets for our different content types, all of which employ the same core data. This is part of the program version set. We've got 88 separate fields. You know, that's, that's a lot of stuff with your cat with your cataloging. Um, we've got sets for sport for Gaelic, for news, for promos, for programs. They're, they're all designed with these areas in mind. And we were perhaps overly conscientious when we created these fields. Um, and we have ended up with a substantial set of fields. And size really doesn't matter. It's, to put it into, you know, it's what you do with it that counts. The importance is with the metadata that it opens the system out and prevents everything being just stuck in there and becoming a dusty old bucket of data that doesn't do anything. And again, that's where our media managers come into play. It's their role to catalogue the content and add enough descriptive metadata to allow the user to find exactly what they need. Um, we catalogue and index in order to allow the reuse of content. It's not just to add information for the sake of it. Um, and it's for this reason that we really need to be able to update and manipulate our data schema as time goes on, and we haven't been able to do that so far. Hence, we have a whole bunch of fields that actually don't have anything in them, because as time's gone on, we found out they're no use to anybody. We based a lot of them on our old systems, you know, and we kind of got stuck in that legacy way of working. But after five years, we know exactly what works and what doesn't work for us. So we're going to be changing that. Our new version will enable us to actually get rid of fields, bring in new fields, and, and it will be a lot more manageable from that perspective. Um, and believe me, we really do need to redefine these cataloging fields. Um, the library contains a mixture of free text and controlled data fields. So we made a lot of choices initially where some would be drop-down lists and some would be free text. Um, there are some areas where really we should have gone with controlled data set rather than allowing our media managers freedom of free text. Um, it's particularly so for names and locations. Um, they're free text fields, which I think we should probably have a names list to build on. We, I've just gone through 250,000 contributor names and uh, I really could have done with a names directory. When you have so many different users adding data, even if they are trained catalogers and librarians, there's always room for error. For, uh, for instance, Ali McCoist. Does everyone know him? Rangers manager, Scotland player. Now, I know he's put on a little bit of weight recently. But to describe him as a ranger's couch, I think, is maybe going a little bit too far. So it's simple little misspellings like that that sometimes can make a massive difference. And if we had a controlled names list, that wouldn't have happened. Um, Barack Obama, forget about the nine different ways that he's in the system. This is how he's described. To describe the US president, there's... I, I don't even know how many different ways there is to say the same thing. Again, if we had a controlled list, that would not happen. Never mind all the stuff that describes him pre-presidency. There's umpteen, he, he has oh, so many different ways of, of describing him. 
Um, as I say, a controlled data set on names and locations in particular is the thing that we are going to bring in in our new version because it will save me certainly an awful lot of time going through and correcting them. And it will also um, prevent people wondering how to spell echo fecken for one thing. Because <laughs> that's another place it's in there with about six different spellings. And it doesn't help the user when the catalogers are putting in things with the wrong spelling. Then the user's trying to second guess. Oh, how would you spell Echo Fecken? I just really like the name Echo Fecken, that's why I brought it up. <laughs> um, so really, if your integrity of the metadata is to be maintained, there has to be a system of checks and controls in place. And Really, I can say from bitter experience with the amount of data we deal with, if manual checks can only go so far, and it would be far more efficient if they were combined with a spell check function or further structured data sets, that would make our system much better. Um, finally, <laughs> I'm going to say something about our search screens. We spent many time, many hours refining these. We provided the users with a number of search templates. This is our sports screen. Um, sorry, excuse me. Go back. Um, each subtly different from the other and tailored to the needs of the different parts of the business. We also ensured that the search would support wildcards, truncation, Boolean searching, phrase searching, searching with taxonomy terms, basically all your librarian-y type things. We made sure they were there. Um, it also supports directories, control drop-down lists to help the user experience and a logging application that ensures the user can go to the exact shot that they need rather than whizzing through backwards and forwards trying to find it. Um, and also simple copyright indicators informing the people of the copyright implications. Everything was created with the thought in mind of making the user search experience simple and effective. We thought it was everything a user could want to help make the most of the archive, but after countless hours of refining metadata sets, building taxonomies, ensuring there was numerous ways to find content, how do our users search? Google. They search like it's Google. And our system is in no way Google. Um, not by a long shot. It's a, good, it's a great system for what it, but it is not Google. But people expect it to be like Google. So that's some examples of user queries. A lot of one word, like things like the person who was searching for scone, were they searching for, you know, a tasty baked product or were they searching for schoon? You know, like Schoon Palace. There's things like that. If you just stick in one word scone, you're going to come up with Schoon Palace. Schoon Palace, you're going to come up with scones on a tree. You know, people just expect the system to come back and ask them, is this what you wanted? And our system currently does not do that. Um, our users are also prone to misspelling, forgetting to put spaces between words. One user puts a wild card after everything in a search, whether it's a date, whether it's a name, even a full Princess Anne, Edinburgh, 1967, there'll be a wild card at the end of it for no real reason because they've obviously been told to search in that way and they've just kept doing it, but it doesn't help their search experience in any way. And with those issues, there's very little we can do currently apart from just guide people, have our media manager again, provide a bit of training, but again, so we've got no spell check function currently, we've got no term suggestion or related terms, but that is something that we are hoping to improve on. That's something that with the new improved search engine capabilities in our new version that we're building just now, that we will be able to help our users search more efficiently and we will continue to keep checks on how our users are searching in order to develop that because that's part of what I do. I look at how people are searching and see what, what's kind of happening with them. I can see that people really need a spell check function. I can see that people really need a related term function. Um, and at the same time, another way of helping them is to continue to build these collections based around our knowledge of current events and archive and basically to just help our users help themselves really is what we're there to do. Um, and hopefully our new version will continue to allow our users to access the content that they need. So finally, <laughs> How do you go about creating a system that will maximise the value of your archive?
do a data stock take. I think that's really important. If we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have had a clue where to start, really. Um, take stock of the data flow in your organization and extinguish any ambiguity by mapping the data between your systems. Make sure that when you say it is an episode title, it really is an episode title. Introduce some control over the flow of the data with a minimum metadata set. Utilize your experts. Make sure that you have people who can support any of the system checks and controls that you may have in place. That to me is one of the most important things you can have, is someone helping the system. And be proactive, keep an eye on your user requirements, because those requirements will help to inform your system development, which is what we've done, we're, we're doing just now. And so if you want to enhance creativity in a digital world, Utilize your experts and your metadata to open the archive, and it's as simple as that. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? We don't. We don't have sound effects. <laughs> We, we don't have sound effects or stills. Um, it's just programs and radio programs, and we can create stills from what we have, but we don't. But we have a stills database anyway, and a, and a sound effects database that we just didn't bother. Yeah. Um, I was just really interested, I think it's an amazing system that you've got here, and absolutely credit to you for sorting it out, um, but I was just interested with the metadata that you have surrounding the, 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 um, the archive and the material, um, and you've talked about the minimum metadata sets that you had, but I was wondering about further metadata to do with the sort of collection of the post-production paperwork and, and rights management, and it sort of suggests that all of that is integrated into it. Yeah, no, that's not integrated into it. <laughs> yeah, it would be way too easy. Um, no, um, basically from a rights perspective, all we are able to deal with is we give a basic kind of amount of, of detail, whether you can use it or not, what the um, restriction detail is. Is it a royal restriction? Is it, you know, editorial restriction? We're not connected in any way to those systems you know with with more proprietary kind of data in them and um, we can take extra metadata from the production systems like avid like vcs we we do have fields that they do map to but we don't take in uh, like anything like production paperwork type material can i go now <laughs> thank you very much for listening